You consume it daily. You go through more than you probably realize. You are literally made of it. But how much do you really know about water? Join me, Lake Story Water, and my droid, H2O, as we travel in search of the science behind water and water-related concepts. This is Story of Water. What is a wetland? A simple definition of a wetland is an area that is located between places that are always dry and places that are always wet. In order to be considered a wetland, at some point every year, an area must be reliably covered by water or have water just below the surface. Some wetlands are flooded year-round, while others are just barely covered by water for a short period of time. Regardless of how much or how long water has covered it, another important characteristic is that the soil remains saturated for long periods. The wet soil develops special characteristics by not having access to as much oxygen as dry soil. This is known as hydric soil and allows for specialized plants that are adapted to grow in wet conditions. All wetlands have hydrophytes, which are plants that grow in wet conditions. Why should I care about wetlands? Well, wetlands provide many benefits to plants and animals, as well as to us. About one-third of all threatened and endangered species can only live in wetlands. Many other animals call wetlands home at some point in their life. This includes half of all bird species in North America. The wetlands habitat provides shelter for sleeping, laying eggs, raising young, and resting during long migrations. Scientists estimate that about 40% of all animals on Earth breed or are born in wetlands. Animals eat either the plants that grow in the wetland or smaller animals like insects that live in that wetland. Since so many plants and animals live in wetland areas, they contain much biodiversity, which is important for the overall health of an ecosystem. What do wetlands do for us? Think of wetlands like a giant natural sponge. They take in extra water from heavy rains or snowmelt and can store that water. So why does this matter? Well, one, wetlands help clean water by filtering out bad things such as pollution and sediments. These contaminants are removed and stored in the wetlands before the water may end up in our drinking supply. Second, this helps prevent flooding by keeping that extra water from flowing to areas where people are. An average-sized wetland can store about 1 million gallons of water. Third, wetlands located at or near coastlines also prevent erosion of lakeshores. They act as a buffer and absorb, and thus lessen, the impact of flood water, wind, and waves. One study found that for every two and a half acres of wetland removed from coastal areas, storm damage increased by $33,000. Another way wetlands contribute to our health is through recreation. Wetlands are beautiful environments to visit with all the plants, animals, and water they contain. There are many opportunities to hike, hunt, fish, birdwatch, kayak, canoe, and do other activities. This also helps support local economies near wetlands because tourists coming in to visit these natural landscapes bring money with them. Up to a billion people worldwide depend on wetlands for their livelihood, and these activities have a combined economic impact of over 100 billion in just the United States. Based on these economic factors, one study found the value of all wetlands on Earth to be about $15 trillion. One more important benefit of wetlands for people is in combating climate change. One of the many drivers of climate change is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Plants in wetlands continuously take in carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. When plants die, they become part of the soil and any carbon in that plant is now stored long term in the soil. One study estimated that after about 40 years of restoring a wetland area, the soil could hold 10 times more carbon than it did when it was farmland. Scientists estimate that one-third of all the stored carbon on Earth is contained in wetlands. If 
I had to guess what most people envision when they think of wetlands, they probably picture a pond with small trees protruding out of the water, covered in lily pads, and surrounded by cattails. Sure, that would be a wetland, but there are actually several different types of wetlands, all varying in the amount of water and type of life that live in it. Here are explanations of some of the different categories of wetlands. A defining characteristic of a marsh is that it contains herbaceous or soft-stemmed plants rather than woody plants or trees. They contain plants such as cattails, lilies, sedges, and grasses. Tidal marshes can be found near coastlines, while freshwater marshes are usually found near lakes or rivers. Marshes are home to many species of plants and animals. Marshes are very good at filtering pollutants out of the water and reducing flooding by absorbing excess water flow. Vernal or ephemeral ponds are temporary marshes that are covered in water only in spring, hence the name vernal, which means spring. Marshes are home to many species of waterfowl, such as herons, geese, and ducks. Sedge meadows are made up of sharp, triangular stemmed sedges, grasses, and wildflowers. Sedges are sharp, triangular stemmed grass like plants. Sedge meadows tend to be wet only after the snow melts, then dry the remainder of the year. They are sometimes referred to as wet meadows or dry marshes, as they are technically a type of marsh. The northern harrier is a distinctive bird that can be found in sedge meadows. Swamps are wetlands with trees. Other names include forested wetlands and lowland forests. Freshwater swamps typically occur near rivers, but some may occur near lakes. Northern swamps contain conifers, while southern swamps contain shrubs, cypress, and tupelo trees. Saltwater swamps are usually found on tropical coasts, and their distinctive trees are mangroves. The soil is usually covered by shallow water, but the water may recede and the ground may become visible during later summer months. Swamps are home to ducks, otters, and snakes. You can recognize a bog by the sphagnum moss that covers it like a floating mat. Bogs can also have smaller conifer trees. Bogs get their water from rainfall, and the water that accumulates in the bog is acidic. This unique water and soil chemistry allows for pitcher plants, cranberries, and blueberries to thrive in bogs. Amphibians, such as frogs and salamanders, make their homes here. Fens are dominated by grasses, sedges, and wildflowers, such as fringed gentians and lady slippers. Fens are opposite to bogs in two main ways. Their water comes from the ground, and the water is slightly basic. Numerous wildflowers mean numerous insects can be found flying around fens. Does everyone know how important wetlands are? Unfortunately, no. For years, wetlands were viewed as a nuisance. Wetlands were drained to dry land for farming and later for building cities, roads, and other land development. They were drained by digging drainage ditches and laying drainage tiles or pipes underground to whisk the water away to nearby rivers or lakes. In the Midwest United States, for example, Wisconsin lost 50% of its wetlands and Illinois 90% in the last 200 years. Compounding the loss of wetlands is pollution of those wetlands. In many parts of the world, extreme amounts of pollution from mining, pesticide, and fertilizer runoff from farms and industrial waste all contribute to the declining health of wetlands. Wetlands can only absorb so many contaminants before water becomes undrinkable. Plant species die off and animals leave to find better habitat. Remember the carbon storage mentioned earlier? When wetlands dry up, all that carbon that was safely stored away can enter back into the atmosphere, contributing to a warming climate. Global leaders and activists realized that the world was losing wetlands at an alarming rate, and in 1971, 18 countries met in Iran and adopted the Convention on Wetlands. Also known as the Ramsar Convention, for the city the meeting was held in, its goal is to conserve, protect, and promote the wise use of wetlands. From 18 nations at the beginning, 
the Convention on Wetlands has grown to be signed by 171 nations. World Wetlands Day is now observed on February 2nd, the date of the Ramsar Convention. Many activities are held worldwide to draw attention to the importance of wetlands. Has the Convention on Wetlands worked? That is a complicated question to answer. At first thought, it may not appear so. Since 1971, the world has lost 35% of its wetlands due to either human or natural processes. However, there is some evidence to suggest that it has worked. Wetlands have emerged as a key component in the fight against climate change. Companies that are looking to offset their carbon emissions are restoring wetlands. Many environmental organizations are working on restoring wetlands and getting legislation passed to protect them. Since the inception of the Ramsar Convention 50 years ago, 2,416 wetland areas, covering a total area of over 629 million acres, have been designated as wetlands of international importance. Here is some information on a few noteworthy wetlands. The first wetland of international importance was the Coburg Peninsula. Designated as such in 1974, this wetland in the Northern Territory of Australia contains both freshwater and brackish wetlands. It is home to rare plants, many waterfowl, and several threatened species of turtles, specifically loggerhead, green, and hawksbill turtles. The largest wetland of international importance is the Rio Negro. Located in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, it covers almost 30 million acres. The importance of this site can't be underestimated, as it contains such a large amount of tree and plant life that it helps regulate the planet's climate and carbon capturing abilities. Endangered mammal species that live here are the giant river otter, the Brazilian bear-faced tamarin, and the white-bellied spider monkey. The most recently designated wetland of international importance is the Sasmuan Pampanga Coastal Wetlands. It became one in February 2021. Located in Manila Bay in the Philippines, it contains several threatened bird species, including Nordman's or Spotted Green Shank, Black Faced Spoonbill, and Far Eastern Curlew. What about wetlands in the United States? In the United States, there are 41 wetlands of international importance. The largest and perhaps most famous is the Everglades. Located at the southern tip of Florida, the Everglades consist of 1.5 million acres roughly split into two main wetlands, one freshwater and one brackish and saltwater. Over 1,000 species of plants and 120 types of trees can be found here. The newest wetland of international importance in the United States is the Lower Wisconsin Riverway. It received its designation in February 2020. It is located in Wisconsin and threatens species such as the chimney swift, rusty blackbird, ornate box turtle, and the endangered Higgins eye pearly mussel make their home here. Where can I find wetlands to visit? Wetlands are probably closer to you than you realize. Wetlands cover about 6% of the Earth's land surface and 5% of the land surface in the United States. That's equivalent to an area the size of California. The best place to start is by checking with your state's DNR. Their website may have a listing of wetlands in your area. Many state and local conservation groups also have websites that contain lists of wetlands. Finally, you can go to our website story-of-water.com and check out the blog that will have some links to several websites that can help you locate your local wetlands. So get out there and enjoy all that wetlands have to offer. Thanks for joining us on Story of Water. If you liked what you heard, why not subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast provider? Let your friends and family know about it as well. Connect with us and listen directly at www.story-of-water.com. Check out the blog or email us feedback. If you really enjoyed the show, become a Patreon supporter. 
just click the donate button on our website. Remember, stay hydrated. See you next time on Story of Water.